This well, conference will well, now I be recorded. Couple, I, I see a couple of familiar names here, so. Awesome. Uh, thank, thanks so much for making, uh, taking the time to no talk problem. about CXL with this group. Okay, uh, sure. Please start at your convenience. Okay, sure. Uh, give me just one more. Uh, sure. Half a minute. Sure, sorry. So, um, let me see. Do you need an introduction to the group? Uh, so, Michael, would you mind doing an introduction, uh, introducing David to the group? If um... uh, I, I can, I can introduce myself. Oh, perfect. So that's okay. Thank that's you. okay. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, Thank you. Okay. So, yeah. So, my my name is Dave Wong. I'm a director of memory product planning at Samsung. Um, I'm basically the U.S. contact point for Samsung uh, for several different things. Uh, one of which is uh, CXL. The other one is sort of you know processing and memory. Um, I, I'm kind of the weird stuff guy, right? The, the stuff that uh, doesn't uh, is in the main line and pathfinding, so a little bit uh, further out. Um, you know, I get thrown out to look at uh, to, to kind of look at these things. So I looked at things like you know uh, graph analytics or or cryptocurrency and, and all sorts of you know consensus all sorts of weird stuff like that. Um, my background is a memory systems architect. Um, I, I've uh, authored co-authored a, a book on uh, memory systems, uh, and, and my specific area of specialty is sort of uh, DRAM uh, memory subsystems, uh, you know DDR4, DDR5, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's sort of my background. Um, so so what I'll, I'll do today, I hope it's okay with you. So Mike, Michael asked me to give a talk uh, on sort of CXL and other related topics. And I asked him, you know, what, what specific area, because, you know, if, you, if it's, you know, we can make the talk as short as 15 minutes or as long as, you know, three hours. Uh, but uh, the direction wasn't very specific as to, you know, just, you know, bring us something interesting. I think that's what the, the topic was. Uh, so what I, you know, uh, after some discussion, I, I think what I'll do is I'm going to sort of kind of reuse the slides that I use for the uh, OCP's uh, uh, Future Technology uh, Symposium that uh, at, for the Software Defined Memory Group. Uh, I gave a talk there last fall uh, um, on sort of processing and memory and sort of CXL. Um, the talk was about 20 minutes, and so I think it's still worthwhile to kind of reuse the slides and, and uh, give the talk again. Uh, for a couple of different th reasons. I think one of the reasons is that this is a little bit different um, forum and we have a little more time rather than tw 20 minutes. I, I think we have uh, close to an hour. And I think that I can go slower and be more interactive uh, so that if you have any questions, you know, stop me and, and uh, we can ask, uh, we can chat, right? Um, and the other thing was that this, this talk uh, is a little different. It was structured to sort of like try to combine two slightly different things um you know which is sort of uh, processing uh, in memory and near memory and then leading into cxl so i looked at the slides and i think what i'll do is i'll i'll, I'll kind of follow the the uh previous uh, train of thought and the, the slideware structure and talk a little bit about sort of processing in memory and, and near memory and the lead into cxl again because um Part of the processing near memory could leverage the CXL, uh, you know, sort of you know, interconnection, and it kind of leads into it. So I, I hope you will put up with me as I talk a little bit about the the, the front part, the processing memory. And uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me. I think uh, we have uh, the time for that. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds Great. good. Thank, Thank you. you. And Alan, I'm sure is going to be like all in on processing and memory. So. Oh at yes, point, and, uh, I, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, some point you're going to get off mute. So uh, yeah, I, I've spoken with Alan a few 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 hundred times. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey, Alan. Okay. He's muted so, for some reason. Oh, for for the, oh, tell, uh, further. Yeah, yeah, sorry, guys. I had to I had to step away. Hi, hi, David. Nice to nice to see you again. Nice um, to see you. Be good to catch up. Good to catch up. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, right, um, so let's see, this is just the, the slide where I'll talk about sort of processing memory and, and CXL sort of thing. And uh, this is the, uh, oh, everyone can see my slide, I presume, right? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. 
Okay. It's uh, it's not in presentation mode though. If that's what uh, you're intending. That, that that's fine. Because okay. the presentation mode brings out some weird stuff. Of it, I, I try to make the uh, presentation area as large as possible. I hope that's uh, good enough. Yeah, looks okay. good. All right. Uh, disclaimer. Um, basically, it, it's a kind of te uh, standard template by the legal people. Um, what it means is that uh, you know I'm going to say things that does not necessarily represent uh, the view of Samsung. Um, so, so essentially, I can tell you anything, and and Samsung, the uh, corporate entity, does not have to be responsible for it. Uh, so that's kind of a standard boilerplate. Um, so, don't don't take my word for anything. Just take this uh, official uh, press release for you know the product announcements and and things like that. Okay. Uh, so this was a flow which I, I spoke a little bit about processing memory and, and processing near memory and then CXL and then some of the software uh, structure that's needed. Okay, SMTK. Okay, um, so processing memory is something that uh, you know Samsung is, is, is working on, and uh, it's kind of the rationale is uh, being uh, given here is that right now a lot of the system level performance is sort of constrained by um, access to memory. And uh, so what well, access to memory uh, is both uh, two contexts. One is both latency and bandwidth. And, you know, we don't have a good way to kind of solve this latency issue. And so what we've always tried to do, obviously, is uh, solve it through sort of parallelism, put more and more logic in, in a single glob of stuff. And just try to pipeline and schedule act the data accesses to to memory, and so we've uh, we've sort of um, turned changed the problem a little bit to, to a problem that we could sort of solve. So now this new problem just requires us to provide more and more bandwidth so that the data can flow freely between the logic the, the glob of logic and the, the memory. Um, so, but uh, what this is uh, this is trying to motivate is that we've we've been trying to do this kind of by brute force uh, for the last couple of decades. We've not, we've tried to, you know, um, make the wires um, faster, uh, run, operate faster and faster. Uh, we've got the, this, the, uh, it's sort of amazing. We look back, right, the, the several, you know, um, 200 megahertz or, or 400 mega uh, transfer data wires. Now we're operating them uh, at uh, you know uh, three gigatransfers and, and going to four gigatransfer to, to five to six, and uh, we're cramming more and more wires uh, onto the system boards. But obviously, we're getting to a point that it's getting incredibly difficult to uh, cram more and more wires, more and more CPU balls, um, and, and more and more things, if you will, onto the the, the system board. You, you can still do it, um, but you know it's getting to the point that we have to sort of pay more and more money. So this bandwidth cost is getting more and more expensive uh, in terms of both um, you know the packaging technology that we're using and the power to move data and, and that sort of thing. And so I think uh, uh, we're looking, going back and looking at an old idea is sort of looking at sort of processing and memory to sort of, um, Try to avoid moving data between the the logic and the memory block, and see if we can just put a little bit amount of logic on near the memory or in the memory, and try to eliminate some of the data movement. Okay. By the way, as I mentioned, right? Um, if you have any, uh, we we have the time. So if you have any questions, feel free to stop me, and and uh, we could uh, chat. Okay. And so one of the things that uh, we're, uh, Samsung is currently doing is that we're looking at um, combining some logic into the uh, the high bandwidth memory uh, stack, the HBM stack. And the first uh, demonstration vehicle that we've done is that we've taken the uh, Samsung's sort of production uh, memory device, the uh, HBM2 Aquabolt device that is being deployed, currently deployed in uh, some uh, um, GP, GPU systems in the HP AI and HPC systems. We've taken that, that um, HBM device and replaced the core die uh, with uh, a different, what, what I mean a core die is a, a DRAM die. We replaced the DRAM die with a slightly different structured DRAM die that instead of just all DRAM, it's now um, 
some DRAM arrays uh, arranged around some uh, processing logic. Okay. Um, and that processing logic is uh, sort of very simple uh, sort of uh, computational units that can um, in parallel compute a bunch of floating point FP32, FP16, and int16 um, data type uh, data, right? So it's a bunch of wide registers and a bunch of um, floating point and, and in computational units, okay? And uh, we call those uh, um, the harder units of the programmable compute unit, or PCU. Okay? Um, and the way that uh, we're doing is that we're trying to provide a lot of um, parallelism. And so a lot of there, for each channel in the HPM device, there are a lot of banks, um, 16 uh, banks in HPM2, I believe. And um, some of these, uh, we've put in new commands so that uh, we can, once we set up the data properly, we can issue a command to, uh, have the uh, eight or 16 banks process the data in parallel. So it provides a, a high level of parallelism uh, to, uh, to accelerate the FP32 or FP16 or int 16 data types, right? So that's what this means is a multi-bank parallel operation. So that's the, the thing that we're doing. And here's the actual uh, uh, silicon die photo that uh, of the memory device that we're, we've created. And um, um, for uh, the, the way we've done this is that um, we've sort of this is a, a you know an experiment. So we've we've taken the production HVM2 device and just sort of taken out the uh, DRAM die and redesigned it, and then um, put in some sort of hidden hooks to um, uh, to to sort of operate the programmable compute units on the uh, DRAM core dies. Um, but we left the um, buffer dive and the everything else, mechanical and electrical specifications uh, unchanged. So that uh, this uh, HVM device is basically a drop-in drop replacement for um, existing Aquabolt uh, HVM2 devices. Uh, we did that specifically so that we wouldn't have to make uh, system level changes or require memory controller changes or require system level changes uh, so that we could uh, quickly and easily um, bring up and, and test the, these concepts. Um, and, and so that we could, uh, you know, we work, we work with uh, a couple of different partners, which uh, they were quite happy that they could take uh, one of these new HVM um, to PIM devices and drop into um, systems that already used our Samsung's uh, HVM, HVM2 Aquable devices. And the rest of the effort is our software efforts to, you know, um, to figure out how to uh, partition and place the data appropriately, how to issue the sort of secret commands to get the uh, hardware to execute uh, the uh, uh, data, in, you know, in parallel to, to, to accelerate data in parallel, and then to sort of convert some of the workloads for, for testing. Uh, so, the, so there's a lot of the more of the back end uh, software effort. And what we've done is that we've um, sort of um, uh, implemented in, uh, here's the Xilinx uh, FPGA subsystem. And um, we uh, tested some uh, workloads uh, on them and ac accelerate some specific workloads and sort of attain some benefits in terms of uh, performance acceleration and sort of energy and latency reduction. So these are, uh, relatively small sort of micro benchmarks, and they're just sort of first um, proof that uh, some of these concepts could be made to work. And we're just sort of using the these uh, uh, micro benchmarks in the system as sort of a learning experiment, experiment to sort of understand what kind of workloads are amenable to um, this type of structure and acceleration, and uh, what we can do to sort of improve on future implementation. Okay. So that, that's sort of the, the things that we looked at, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, quick just question, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, there, go, go ahead. Yeah, a very quick question, if it's okay. Uh, you're showing a lot less energy. Is it the same for power, or uh, do you also save a lot, say, on peak power, for example, by with this arrangement? So the energy profile is uh, changed uh, significantly 
the peak power, uh, depending on what it is that you're doing, the peak power may actually be higher um, because you're actually moving the, um, you, you're kind of changing the, some of the shape of the computation. Um, now, if, uh, the way that I like to think about it is, is that um, for a given problem, uh, and if you think, think about it from a traditional, so logic centric view, right? Um, yeah. Meaning, um, there are certain parts of the, the, the problem that's for a, very much uh, amenable to uh, getting the data from the, the memory. And then within the, the SRAM and uh, the dense logic uh, computation used in, in, the, in the logic device, if, you, if, you, if you're going to pound on this data repeatedly for you know, a million, 10 million times, right? It, that's the, the best way to do it. Um, and, and, and you get a lot of reuse out of that data. And then during this time that you're pounding on your memory, the, 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 sorry, you're pounding on the local cache, right? The HPM device is sitting there not doing very much, right? Um, but there, in other parts where it's sort of memory bound, you're, you're sitting there just moving data, grabbing it uh, into the GPU or, or, or FPGA, and you're touching the memory, you know, a, a couple of times before sort of discarding it, right? Um, and then this is this is sort of classical kind of memory bound. And then you know the the memory system bus is sort of a bottleneck trying to fetch data for you. Uh, so in in that, in that view, right, this is sort of the most bandwidth intensive thing that you're trying to move data. But even yeah. in this context, when you're moving data, right, you're doing it uh, from pretty much from one bank at a time. And that's the whole point of a sort of a, a DRAM device with a lot of banks is that you're trying to grab data from one bank and then pipeline and schedule uh, from a different bank and just sort of you know pipeline and, and schedule it. So these banks are sort of concurrently operating in different stages of a data fetch operation. And you can sort of pipeline up to you know 16 uh, banks, right? Okay. The, we've so we've changed basically... the structure of the operation so that you could um, operate on these banks sort of in parallel. Uh, so that you can issue a single command and eight or 16 banks sitting there fire off and try to do floating point computations in parallel. Uh, so during these, this operation, uh, right, the core die memory consumption, uh, sorry, power consumption will be higher. So you'll see power spike during that specific period of time, uh, but the interface is quiet, right? So you're actually not doing the data transport between the HPN device and the GPU. So the power uh, profile of the device uh, will look different. Um, and, and I think uh, if you look at it, I think um, the actual power envelope may actually be even higher, um, but the sort of the, the, the dura time duration of your overall computation may be shortened, if you will. So that's how we look at the sort of energy consumption is that you know the, if you can shorten the time computational time, uh, during the computation, part of it may sure. actually be higher, right? The system level yeah. now. So that should help, you know, with your battery or electric bill. But but if the power is higher, do you ever get to a situation where you say you need better cooling, for example, because of the solution, or is it too short when the power is high for the system to see that increase um, in power? We. It, uh, we have we actually have not looked uh, how should it? we we understand that we're changing sort of the shape of the the computation right how we're doing the computation and and then the the execution profile will look different and so the uh, energy the consumption profile and the sort of electrical profile will all all look different and have slightly different requirements um, but the um, but that wasn't the focus of this study, right? This study was just sort of saying, uh, looking at if we did this, uh, will there be um, overall performance and energy improvements in specific parts of the execution? And I think uh, we sort of shown that, that there could be, uh, uh, there, there is, and there are. Um, but yeah, we, we, but yeah, changing the shape of computation, but part of it will be higher. Um, um, you know, it, it's kind of a problem is being recorded and we will be solve it later kind of thing okay okay, so okay the thank you the study. so david just okay. a couple of points of clarification um so on this particular example 
you've put the processor in memory just in the DRAM die and there's no changes to the logic die? Yes. Okay, thank you. And the second question, on this example of 2x faster and 2x less energy, is that either 2x faster or 2x less energy or 2x faster and 2x less energy? I I I believe it is a uh, you know two uh, x faster and two x uh, le whatever two x less energy for uh, this specific sub benchmark. So I think the way that I, I would kind of look at this is say over the uh, course of this run of this specific benchmark, the execution time was I'm trying to do the math in my head uh, maybe like uh, forty five percent of what it was before. And then, uh, and then the overall uh, sort of the total amount of energy cons consumed was probably 90% uh, of what it was doing normally. Nice, nice. Right. Thank you. So, so, so you put those two together, it's like, oh, this is uh, so much faster, and uh, overall it's so much less energy. But uh, but again, going back, right, the, during the execution time itself, there may be spikes that were higher than previously. Yeah, it's, it's a system problem, right, David? You've got to say, well, uh, you know, overall we have a win, but yes, the, the FPGA is doing less and the memory is doing more, so you're shifting the power around for sure. It's, but it's, uh, you're starting to think about this systematically, uh, which is which is what we all need to do. So that's fantastic. Okay. Right. So yeah, so I'd love, uh, we do it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in in any uh, stack, basically, when you have a processing in memory, for example, stack number one, and then in the stack number two, there is another processor and memory, is the processor in stack one and two can communicate to each other directly, or it's just only through the same memory as the same stack? Uh, so so the, these are kind of, uh, if, if you think, the way to kind of think of it is that these are kind of slave uh, uh, subordinate uh, ALUs sitting in the memory device itself. And then you kind of have a host come and issue a command. And, and then this memory is a dead dumb thing that sits there and says, oh, you want me to execute this uh, parallel computational command on all eight banks or all 16 banks. So I'm going to do it on my local memory, right? Uh, so the this, this logic uh, doesn't have sort of you know, uh, cross communication capability. It doesn't issue another memory request through the network to another memory stack. This is really just a kind of a host issued low uh, command uh, from the uh, right. So, so the host tells the memory stack, rather than give me data from this bank, keep the data there, and but just go do this operation, uh, which is in turn ends up being a FP or 16 or 32 operation. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, quick question. Um, you, I think you said at the beginning uh, part of your part of your job was to to, to do a bit of gazing into the future. Is could it could it be that um, with the processor in, in memory that analog computers could 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 could, could be used? Is, is any consideration being given to that? So so you so you basically have a memory die and then you have a bit of a few analog computing components on it um i i uh, personal opinion but i think it certainly could right i mean um at least uh, from the system sort of programmatically from the system view right it does i don't really see the analog part i just issue a command and the memory die or what have you ag aggregates the, the result and all i have to do is sort of retrieve the result right so i think I think that could be done. Okay, but it's not not something that's being worked on. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, the how should I, analog compute and um, DRAM doesn't work all that well together. Um, I think you a lot of the analog stuff I looked at um, there sort of requires some sort of um, sort of persistent media, if you will, and they accumulate uh, electrons sort of analog on, on these wires uh, that. That concept doesn't work very, work very well for traditional memory uh, structure. It's a DRAM structure, sorry. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Alan, you have something else? 
Okay, uh, let me, uh, we do have time, but <laughs> seems like I'm using a lot of it. So let me go a little faster. Um, so, uh, so the other thing that we're kind of working on is sort of the near memory compute, right? So the HVM device is sort of ideal to do kind of uh, experiment on in-memory compute because each memory device uh, provides all the you uh, know the entire cache line for uh, for every single request from the the processor or, or GPU or what have, what have you. Um, so you see the full data with, with um, and then you can sort of um, you know take the the cache line and do what you need and return it. Uh, but certain other memory subsystems, for example, your, your DDR4, DDR5 uh, subsystems, the uh, you know the the data is you know specialized uh, across multiple devices, and it's uh, not a, not not as a good thing to kind of process on little slices of data. Not 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 as easy. Um, so we're kind of looking at this uh, AX DIM sort of thing, uh, which is um, basically the same sort of concept, but instead of in memory, we're just putting the uh, the lo logic on a sort of local buffer device. Um, on the memory module itself. And again, the, the concept is the same. You're trying to eliminate or, or reduce the CPU to memory data movement, but you are just basically intercepting it in a, uh, a logic device between the CPU and memory, right? Um, and here the, the parallelism is, uh, rather than bank level parallelism, is sort of rank level parallelism. And so, you know, same sort of commands are sent to multiple ranks of memory devices on a given module. And then these modules, if you have multiple modules uh, per channel, then these modules can kind of operate in parallel as well. Right? Um, and again, it's the same concept. You're just trying to alleviate the uh, memory bus bottleneck. And the acceleration functionalities are sort of pl placed into the buffer device on the memory module itself. Okay. So that's the, the, the same basic idea. Um, so, uh, Sorry, sorry, did you say yeah. you've got acceleration in the in the buffer chip, or or is it the same DRAM chips that you were just talking uh, about? It, it's it's this is a this is a, a this is a DDR4 module basically. Um, so they basically uh, basically build a DDR4 module with a gigantic sort of uh, re repeat of the uh, um, kind of the mem gigantic memory buffer unit, right? Yeah, that has yeah. a Right. So, so the yeah, the acceleration is in the uh, in the buffer okay. devices. So. They're standard. They're standard memories in this one. Yes. yes. Okay. So, so have you put this into the logic die as well, and just use standard memory memories in the HBM? So you've got a near memory acceleration rather than an in memory acceleration. R right. If we put the yeah, right. I think. I, yeah, if we had put the logic in the uh, buffer die of the HBM, I think you, I, it's kind of debatable whether you call that in memory or near memory, but yeah, that, that would probably be called. Yeah, uh, I call it near memory. So, so yeah, I, I was just wondering that what you're doing here, you could also do in the logic die of the HBM. And so, so that, that would be an interesting experiment. You haven't done that then? We haven't done that. Um, uh, and, uh, well, at least we've kind of looked at putting logic in the buffer die of the HVM device, and that's uh, quite complicated. I mean, it you know, it logically it sounds you know great, but um, practically it, it's rather difficult. Um, I, I think uh, you, you, for a bunch of different reasons, but uh, the base die of the uh, HVM device is actually not not very empty. It's it's actually filled with stuff. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, DRAM test structures, uh, programming, uh, programmable t test engines down there. Right. And there's a lot of uh, decoupling stuff. Uh, so uh, people, things that uh, people don't normally think about is for, for HVM device, there's a lot of um, power spikes, right? That the HVM device can can go from zero watt or, 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 or single digit uh, watt, one or two watts to 20 watts or, or what, what have you very quickly. Okay, and, so the, uh, the power management of the logic layer at the bottom is is a bit challenging. There, there's not a lot of, not a lot of room for logic down there, and uh, and the bandwidth uh, between the logic die and the DRAM die is not very different uh, from the bandwidth between the uh, base buffer die and the host, if you will. Right. If, if you have more bandwidth internally, you could take advantage of that, 
by intercepting it and do something on the base uh, die. But right. if the bandwidth are approximately equal, there's not a lot of benefit. Right, right. But uh, I understand. But 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 the reality is, though, if if you could do some simple, the, you you get away from this granularity problem of the individual DRAM channels that, with your other method. You get mm -hmm. back to the same advantages of this DIM method. But um, you you do gain the fact of you don't have if you can put a simple like a uh, uh, needle in a haystack type function into that logic die really trivial atomic type level functions in that logic die. I tried to do this with the government with HMC at the time when the HMC was out with Micron. We were trying to get the logic die changed there. Um, uh, so. Um, but, so, but if you can do it in that logic die, that is a much less power than moving it across the transceivers to the CPU, into the CPU's cache, and the CPU doing the same thing. So it may not be quite as much power saving as, as being able to do stuff in the DIM, but you need, all, you need to tier all of these functions, right? Yeah. Alan, we have another problem here is that uh, differing from HMC, the bottom die of the HBM device is a DRAM process. Oh, is it really? Yes, it is. Oh, I thought it was a logic process. Oh, interesting. Mm. Okay, no, that, that, okay, that's why that doesn't help then. All right. <laughs> okay, thanks. No. <laughs> well, what, why, why not make it logic? Well, it, it's a, uh, why make it the, a logic process to, uh, unless you need, need it, right? Right, well, well it's so. A lot, it's, a, it, it's a lot lower cost. That's a good reason. A, D, a, a logic process or DRAM is a lot lower cost. Yes, the ARM processes are lower cost, right? Okay. We, we don't have any of the the, the fancy stuff for uh, uh, the, the you know channel stressors or or you know 10, 15, 10, 12, whatever layers of metal, right? Interesting, uh, so, interesting. So that's 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 very interesting. Uh, okay, I, I I always thought it was a logic guide, like HMC. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. Let's. Uh, sorry, uh, we're not going to end up talking about the uh, um, CXL very much, but hopefully. Uh, you know, people are finding it interesting. Anyways, um, anyway, so let me go very, very quickly. Uh, evaluation results. Uh, so we actually worked with, uh, uh, you know, um, Facebook uh, slash Meta on this. Uh, it, it's uh, not revealing, revealing secrets here. There's a couple papers that's uh, cited down here that they've published that they kind of use this to kind of uh, look at their uh, recommender, uh, recommender system which they try to shift the computation to the buffer die to do some uh, processing uh, near memory. And they see some amount of, of speed up per proportional to amount of uh, memory parallelism that you can sort of get. Uh, the DIM itself that we have have uh, two ranks and they uh, sort of say, okay, if you do this in parallel, you can get the 1.8x uh, speed up from the hardware. And if you can put more ranks that they project that, you know, we could pr perhaps get, you know, 3.5x speed up if you have four ranks and, you know, 6.9x if you can get, the, you know, eight ranks. So that's sort of the, the basic idea. But uh, again, uh, sort of echoing er uh, earlier um, discussions, if you start putting a lot of these memory, um, a lot of uh, parallel ranks in, in the memory subsystem, uh, it, it will change the computational profile, will change their power profile, and so there are a lot of sort of knock-on uh, side effects. So uh, it may not, you know, specifically be, you know, uh, um, usable to, in a real system to, you know, you, you can't really do this in an unmodified system is sort of my point. Uh, but these are sort of, uh, you know, studies to, to sort of understand how we can change the shape of um, the computation and uh, attain system level benefits of performance acceleration and energy cost reduction. And perhaps in the future, we can sort of design systems differently to take advantage of these sort of uh, um, observations and, and benefits. Uh, but in, you know, so, so it's kind of a, a learning sort of thing and it doesn't really necessarily mean that we will uh, do this to um, you know, implement in legacy systems, right? Okay. Uh, so to just try to conclude this as fast as I can. Um, so looking at sort of the in and near memory uh, sort of compute, right? At least certain th certain things that we kind of looked at is that uh, for different classes of systems, right? Uh, for a system that implements HBM device and a system that implements uh, LPDDR5 devices, they're, they're different systems for different targets. 
And so if you're looking at um, sort of the processing and memory, um, there's probably not a single formula that you can apply to all different memory types. Uh, the HPM for sort of processing and memory uh, the demand for a system that uses HPM device, they would probably want to have uh, some sort of uh, FP16 or FP32 acceleration. But for LPDDR5 device systems, they're more likely to be your, your cell phones or tablets sort of thing. Um, and I think there's still a need for uh, some sort of in-memory uh, acceleration and, and near-memory compute, but the type of uh, computation these systems would need will be different. And they would, uh, at least from what we could observe, they're more likely to be uh, sort, of in, sort of AI inference type of application. So small granularity in type of um, um, acceleration will be, more, will be more important for the for these this class of systems as opposed to HPN devices. So we're looking at a couple of different things. One is that um, the architecture and the structure that we've implemented for PIM is not the right one. And so we're trying to you know, continue to improve on that and also asking for the industry for ideas to see if well there are, is there a better way to handle this uh, uh, processing memory architecture. And the other problem that we're trying to look at is that even within the given architecture uh, for the different type of applications, what are the data types and the kind of um, uh, application that what are the, the things that need to be accelerated for different types of systems and different memory types, right? So th these are different things that we're trying to look at. And then, uh, and then for different uh, classes of applications, we're looking at uh, how much performance benefits and energy cost reductions can be attained and then sort of dis, uh, discussing with everyone, seeing if this is worthwhile and you know, how we can proceed forward. So if you have any ideas, um, you know, we'll build, uh, you know, we're having, we have this discussion at JEDEC and other places as well. Uh, if you have any interest, um, feel free to contact me and, and I'll put you in the right, with the right people to have these discussions. Okay. Actually, we, yeah, we, David, one on of that the things, note, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Topic. I was saying on that note, are you going to make those slides available? I, I'd like to. Uh, this slide, uh, yeah. So, so uh, this specific set of slides uh, is already available. Um, this was the, the talk that I gave uh, at the Future Technology Symposium. So I'll, I'll send this uh, out again, uh, no problem. And also, if you're interested in this, there is actually a whole talk on this sort of near memory compute stuff at last year's uh, Hot Chips. So there's actually a more common comprehensive set of slides on this topic specifically. I'm, I'm okay. interested. If you can send the, this and the link, I would certainly appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Sure. For the okay. No problem. Hey, so um, okay. there is uh, there was another we, question. Yeah, the, the, this is Bobby. Um, we have a POC where we combine uh, a, a, a platform, a, a board POC. And I'm trying to figure out whether we could get our, you know, the, in this right now we have a high, we, we have a hundred gig NIC and a uh, and a uh, CPU from NXP, and but he, he essentially we make daughter cards in a particular form factor. JP can tell JP who's online can say more about this, but it would be nice to get. I mean, are these available in some, you know, okay, can we? Are these available in a regular DIMM slot, or can you uh, only in HBM, or like, can we get our hands on something to insert it into the POC, and then you could sort of get a programming model going? Um, let me. Uh, it, well, uh, I think if it's for the HPM device, it's going to be a lot more complicated um, because it's a uh, it's an HPM device. No, we can't handle HPM. We could handle a regular DIMM. Okay, um, so you can sort of uh, work with uh, something like an uh, th this this AX DIM thing, which is, by the way, it's a gigantic uh, DIM card, if you will, that looks like this, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I can I can put you in touch with the uh, um, w with the the gentleman that's running this program uh, out of um, our offices in in Korea, um, and you know we, we can discuss whether or not. Um, uh, you know, we could supply you with uh, modules to uh, it, uh, to, to uh, have some effort. Uh, it, by the way, it's uh, it's going to be a lot more complicated than just a module, right? Because uh, there's the whole uh, software and, and uh, engineering support uh, go with this as well. So 
we'll, we'll, we can talk about that offline. That sounds good. Okay. All right. So, um, so anyway, so that's sort of the, the conclusion of this sort of uh, processing memory. And, and I'm sorry for doing the bait and switch, but we have like 15 minutes left for CXL. Um, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, so the reason I kind of uh, um, you know, decided that I should talk about the, the front part of the processing uh, in memory and near memory and leading into a CXL is that um, the CXL, uh, obviously this is the, the standard boilerplate uh, slide that people have, have been passing around. The CXL devices, uh, the three devices, um, type one is basically your accelerator device without memory. Uh, type two is sort of your accelerator device uh, with memory. Type three is just the memory device, if you will, right? So uh, Samsung has uh, already announced that we are, um, you know, we're working on some Type three memory devices to provide the, the memory, um, uh, the memory expander, if you will, uh, for the CXL ecosystem. Um, but I think, uh, you know, just looking at our processing in memory and processing near memory efforts, um, the Type two uh, CXL devices could also be very much applicable for that as well, right? Um, so it's something, you know, I'm not making, again, the, referring back to the previous slide, the, word, the disclaimer, I'm not making any product announcements, uh, but there is a good alignment as to what uh, the CXL Type 2 interface provides and the effort that we have for uh, near memory acceleration. Okay. Um, so just sort of uh, summarize on the sort of announcement that we've already made um, is, is that we're uh samsung has a you know press an, uh release that you know link down uh, on the bottom uh that we we're look, working on a uh, 6l type 3 memory device uh we're looking at a uh, very specific edsff form factors uh e3.s uh, e1s and e3l sort of form factors and the first generation devices will have uh, ddr5 as the media and uh, we're targeting sort of high performance and high bandwidth applications um, you know, starting at 128 gigabyte of capacity and going up to um, higher, um, uh, not specifically setting a limit here uh, for higher. And we're looking at other features, for example, uh, dual port uh, support for this memory device. Okay, so these are sort of things that's been announced that so far. Okay. Um, the thing that we're also spending a lot of time uh, and effort on with our customers is sort of looking at the memory pooling applications um, and i think this is the the part that we're getting into that we'll sort of talk about the ecosystem in, in general I, I think uh, uh people are very sort of eager and interested in, in sort of cxl interface and i think uh, uh i've spoken with um, many other um uh, you know representative from other companies and, and even within samsung uh, about the cxl topic and the general feeling we had was that you know during this last uh, OCP uh, you know symposium in, in the fall, it was sort of like a coming out party for CXL, and, and you know the, the CXL was pretty much everywhere, and everyone was was uh, you know very, I've talked to a bunch of people that was very surprised that they had heard a little bit about CXL, uh, but at the OCP uh, symposium it was a you know coming out party and people were. were surprised that we were actually demoing stuff and uh, showing uh, working prototypes and do, doing software development. And so it's becoming very much real. Uh, but even with that sort of coming out party, I think I just want to, um, you know, I'm sure people under, already understand, but I just want to you know, caution everyone that this is a kind of a long, long road, right? We're just getting very baby steps, uh, getting started. Uh, we're starting to build the the module you see on the right hand side, but to sort of get to the vision uh, that people uh, want to deploy these for sort of you know memory disaggregation or, or pool memory, um, we need to look at uh, switching uh, topologies. Uh, and it's not clear to me that uh, you know, automatically that a baseline CXL switch itself uh, will will win, if you will. Uh, it will certainly exist, but there are uh, several different um, efforts looking at different type of switch topologies and, and different type of uh, ways to sort of move memory between the processing logic and the uh, CXL memory devices. Okay. Um, and I think th there are two knock-on effects to the, the sort of um, uh, the sort of looking at mem disaggregated memory. There's going to be a lot of 
software effort required. And uh, I'll talk about one of the, the software effort um, uh, later in, in the, the slide deck. It's basically um, a way to sort of manage the placement and, and movement of data between these different tiers of memory. I think uh, right now memory is, if we think of memory as a sort of local to the processing logic, uh, and sorry, local to the uh, subsystem. And then we sort of have, uh, you know, initial ideas of near and far memory by, look, by having these NUMA concepts, right? Um, whether you can play, if you can place the memory local to the processor itself, as opposed to uh, attached to another processor node, uh, that has certain amount of benefits for um, for computation that uh, that really needs to understand the processing uh, locality, if you will. But with the CXL tiered memory uh, structure in, enabled by sort of CXL memory uh, subsystem in, in in disaggregation. Um, this problem becomes amplified. So you now have, you know, n layers of uh, memory hierarchy. Uh, you have your local DRAM pool, and you have, uh, you know, DRAM on, attached to another processor within the NUMA domain. You have DRAM attached through a CXL subsystem, and then you may have a different type of memory attached through the CXL memory subsystem. So uh, you now have uh, you know, uh, regular memory, slightly slower memory, and even slower memory, and some, you know, you, you have memory that's, uh, you know, uh, a microsecond away or, or more. Uh, so we really need a good understanding of uh, management of these different types of memory and figure out how to, um, how, how the application should, should interact with the entity that controls these pools of memory um, and how to allocate uh, the near memory, how to allocate a, a far memory, and then when you're done, how do you return these memory, if you will? Right? So the tiering management is going to be a big thing that will have to be worked on, and it won't be just a one or two year effort, uh, probably be a, a multi multi year effort. Uh, the other sort of thing that I think is going to be very important, uh, and it's closer to the hardware that is um, that that will require some specialization, is this sort of uh, the fabric manager. Um, the uh, you know assuming you have a, a bunch of different uh, pro uh, pro processing platforms connected to a bunch of different uh, types of uh, um, you know memory appliances if you will uh, how do you connect uh, when you make the request of who's going to make the connection and serve up the, the memory how you do do you um, connect to and release the memory uh, in in a very low level sort of thing so this whole thing of uh, memory fabric, uh, there are some companies just working on it, but I think that's to be another very big piece of the, the software effort uh, that will interact with the hardware uh, uh, at, at a lower la layer. And so this whole infrastructure will take a long time to, to be worked out that, you know, how does the application connect to this tiering management software and how does the tiering management software interact with the fabric management and then how, what kind of media and system topologies are available on the hardware level. Uh, so all these things will have to be worked out in pretty much the next decade or so uh, for us to sort of really enjoy this uh, benefits of the disaggregated memory subsystem. Right? So I, I think that's just a, a long road ahead of us. Uh, I think we're just getting started. Okay. Have you, have you looked at crawl, walk, run strategies? So I, I won't not not the details, but just there, there are very simple ways. We did we did shared memory in the 80s, and it was very simple. So I I, I think we can get started with with some basic strategies without having to go all the way. Well, we're we're getting started with uh, this thing, right? With just a memory device and perhaps yeah, having absolutely yeah. yeah, yeah. Right? And there's no switch. Um, and then you, your tier can start with uh, your, your local DRAM and your NUMA DRAM and then the CXL memory, right? Right, right. right. Um, and then you can start with uh, a CXL memory with a different media type and already you got the, a couple of different layers there, right? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and then uh, you don't really need much of a fabric manager there. Um, you, you could if you like, but, uh, um, you know, th then... <laughs> Then as you grow from from that to this, and I think uh, that that's going to take a while. Right. Okay. Uh, David, have you have you guys seen any um, latency 
issues with the applications, kind of where things start to break, or what kind of experiments have have been done with the different, you know, with applications expecting some type of pneuma hop? How? We, well, the, uh, we haven't really. We're not in the sort of the the performance um, tuning phase of of our program. We're right now just in, in sort of enablement, right? So um, some of the early sort of CXL memory, right? The the, the memory access latency may be very very high, or, or you know 500 nanoseconds, or what have you. But the application is just going to stall and, and wait for the memory to return, right? So it'll it it it, it works it, functionally, um, and that's okay. all we care about at the stage of the game. So we're not in that, you know, the application is so slow it, it it's uh, considered broken sort of uh, thing. You know, right now we're just quite happy that they they run. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so, so anyway, so I think uh, just uh, jumping to a slightly different thing, right? There's a, a lot of sort of learning on this sort of a CXL thing uh, that we're kind of looking at, um, and, and just sort of you know from a very um, low level sort of a practical sort of thing, uh, even something as simple as uh, putting you know uh DRM devices on a mod uh, on a PCB is it, an art in, in in and of itself i think uh people don't quite realize right, that the stem form factor has sort of um hasn't changed very much in pretty much the last 20 years or, or, or thereabouts and what we've learned is that as we um the PCB is going to specifically fit into these sort of one use system if you will so it's that's as big as a a, a dim PCB is going to kind of grow um and then hey, David? yeah sorry we're down to five minutes okay uh okay right let me go to a slightly different mode then um <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of learning to go back to learn and, and figure out how to put DRAM on a pcb again and this edsf thing is designed for NAND devices and not specifically for dram so assuming um you know this uh, cxl with a memory thing uh, takes off uh in a few years at some point in the future, we may have to look at a, a different form factor. But for now, we're, we the, the memory and we'll leverage the infrastructure divine, this, uh, so defined for NAND for SSDs and, and use that, right? Um, and I think uh, this is all very much brand new. Uh, there's a lot of things to, to think about. Um, something as simple as putting the memory controller or the media controller in the CXL subsystem now puts the responsibility to, to deal with the uh, RAS security thermal and also the wonderful stuff onto the device side and that's something that's new and we'll have to really think about and it's uh, not something I can really cover in, in 20 seconds but it is something that's a very very complicated okay um, this is the SMTK is the at least Samsung's effort to start looking at the tiering management software that I spoke about a little bit earlier. Uh, there are a couple other different efforts that I'm, I'm aware of that's sort of trying to start up to look at and do similar sort of things, at least a sort of similar starting point. I think multiple people, or multiple uh, entities are, are seeing the need for starting to think about and figure out how to manage these different tiers of memory and how to manage the, the data migration between them. I think that will part of it will be Solving uh, or managing this this problem will be key to the sort of the enablement of the uh, memory disaggregation ideas and, and concepts. Okay. Um, th again, there's also a slide where on this. So if you're interested, um, so you I will send out this slide where at the end of the day, and uh, if there's more detail on specific topics, whether it's PIM or for the I can send out the hot chips talk. Uh, and there's also some slide on this uh, SMDK stuff for tiering management effort that we're uh, Samsung's working on. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, there's some, uh, some 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 quick summary on, on this. Let me just uh, uh, there's some demo we had done as well. Let me, yeah, let me just quickly kind of conclude. And I'm I'm sorry that uh, you know <laughs> I did the bait and switch and didn't go that deeply into CXL as I had intended, uh, but I, I hope that uh, uh, stopping and answer questions was, was uh, you know, more interactive and more beneficial as well. Uh, so let me just take a quick pause and and, and uh, see if there are any last question, second questions that I can answer before we have to kind of have a, uh, a stop. 
David, the SMDK, is that done in an open group or is that just something Samsung is creating internally? Good, good question. Uh, SMDK is, uh, is a, well, envisioned to be an open source uh, effort. And I think last I, I heard they were still preparing a package for release. Uh, they will eventually put it on GitHub. I don't know if it's done uh, done yet or not, but uh, um, but eventually it'll, it'll get there. Um, let me double check on that. And um, uh, if it's not done yet, it will be done in uh, Q2 of this year. That the, the vision was sort of put it on there at the beginning of this year, but you know, as you know, all these plans uh, take a while to realize. But that's the that's the goal. Do, do you see um, DDR eventually going away and everything being CXL.mem attached? Uh, no, uh, I think uh, direct attach uh, uh, memory is still sort of been, you know, very much beneficial for lower latency and, and lower power um, sort of thing. Uh, CXL enables a, a level of flexibility and system level configurability that will um, be sort of useful. So they're, they're at least in the near term, when I say near term, probably the next five, 10 years, they will be, they will be very much complementary to each other. So I don't see it kind of going away, uh, at least in the next decade or, or, or more. So a loaded question. Um, so, so do you see a, a value in serializing the DDR with an efficient near memory like OMI? It's challenging, uh, it, at least in my view, every time you serialize something, uh, you add latency. Uh, and that's just uh, very difficult to do. Uh, even something as efficient as OMI, you're still adding probably four know, 10, 10 nanoseconds or something like that. But it's four uh, in our dim, ten, less than 10 over an hour dim. Uh, it, it's still something, right? Um, yeah. And I think the argument is that if you don't have to, uh, why would you need to do that, right? With these in-memory things, I think it becomes really quite interesting with, your, with the dim you showed. It's like, why the hell would you want to talk over over that really complicated DDR bus to when you've got compute acceleration in there? So it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I I agree. You know, CXL is a Swiss Army knife. OMI is just a memory channel, and uh, it's just whether we can, and, and you'll, you'll get a lot of beachfront in real estate back on your processor. It's a chipletizing. It's, it's chipletizing at um, at the module level rather than at the um, uh, in, inside the package. Well, actually, the, the way I, I see the main benefit of, of CXL is the, the leverage of the PCIe infrastructure, right? The PCIe 5 sort of thing, right? Yeah. It, it sort of reuse the same pins. And I think that's to these processor guys, right? That's probably the most most beneficial thing is that they don't have to have uh, pins that, you know, that, that may or may not be used. It's the, right. again, your Swiss Army knife pin. That can be used for anything. It can be used right. for PCIe or memory thing, right? But, but DDR consumes by far the most speech front. Uh, under understood, but uh, getting rid of DDR will take a long time. Uh, I think. I know. Well, I, I just put it behind very efficient buffer. Is a, is a, is a, is the discussion I think. Okay. Anyway, thanks. Hey, yeah. thank, thanks, David. I hate to put a stop to this, but uh, we're, we're we're over. So th thanks again. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Thank you for for having me, and uh, um, I'll I'll send the slide to to Michael and have him do you know have him forward it to you. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you, David.